Web Optimization Process Management, an eMetrics presentation by Tim Wilson. Hello, my name is Tim Wilson. I am a uh, digital analyst, have been so for over a, a dozen years. I also go by Gilligan on Data, as maybe this uh, image gives away a little bit. I've been both client side as well as agency side. Uh, in, a, in a range of different positions, always at companies that have a logo that follow, falls somewhere on the blue-green spectrum. But what I'm going to talk about today is the analyst is an agent of change. So the title of this pre presentation is Web Optimization Process Management. And but really what I want to talk about is how can we as analysts, no matter where we are in the organization, actually help our companies pivot and kind of hit that nirvana of truly being data driven. So the analyst is an agent of change and I am gonna say that we will dare to hope, have the audacity to hope that process actually can and will, and in my experience has, helped organizations pivot to truly use data to, to help drive effective decisions and positive, uh, positive business outcomes. So, you know, everyone wants to be data driven these days. That's kind of just a, a given. You can't find a marketer who doesn't say they care about the data. They want to be data driven. Well, what's it actually take to be data driven? Well, it's the same thing that it takes to do anything in business, right? It takes people, process, and technology and some balance of that. If we ask our kind of the typical business user that we're supporting, What's the balance of these three things when it comes to being data driven? Well, the business will most likely come back and say it's all about the technology. We have to have, we have big data. We have all this web activity and social media activity and mobile app activity and we've got to pull it together and, and store it somewhere in some, some big data thing and then we've got to have tools to crunch through that. And yeah, we need, we need people who know how to punch the buttons on that technology but really, it's, it's a technology play. And, and honestly, they're, you know, the vendors out there are going to support the same thing. They're going to say, you know, buy Adobe Analytics and your conversion rate will increase. Well, back in 2006, so a ways back, Avinash Kaushik had a, had a kind of a, 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 a backlash against that. And he came up and, and really sort of represented the analyst's view and said, no, 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 it's, it's really about the people. And, and Avinash's uh, post that he wrote back in 2006 kind of posited this 90-10 rule. The 90-10 rule said, if you have $100 to invest in analytics, you should spend uh, <clears throat> $10 of that on technology and $90 of it on people, on, on motivated, talented, curious analysts, the ones who are going to use the technology. And that was a, a pretty fair... Uh, that's a great way to kind of counter the, the way things were drifting towards this misperception that was all about the technology. Well, I'm going to claim that even that wasn't quite right, that there's this other part that is pr the process. And if as analysts, we actually own, you know, build, maintain, implement, own a process for effectively driving, and it really comes down to a hypothesis-oriented mindset in the company, in a hypothesis-centric approach to analytics, we can actually uh, be more effective as people. This isn't saying that technology is not important. We've got to have the technology. We've got to have the data itself. We've got to have the tools to analyze that data. But a lot of that's becoming pretty commoditized. So the, the point of this talk is around what can we do around process. And what I'll do is lay out a number of, of kind of a very sort of discrete process, but you can, you can pick from it whatever, whatever pieces you like. I will say at, at this URL at the bottom of the slide here, clearhead.me slash eMetrics, there are a number of downloads. There's no, there's no login or sign-in. They're all you know, right there available, just a, a click either to a, a PDF or a Google spreadsheet or an Excel document, uh, as well as this presentation, are all posted there. And I'll reference where there are some of those kind of supporting documents for you to, to go and, and download and use if you uh, uh, see fit. So if it's going to be about process, then I'm actually claiming we need something of a process revolution. And if we're going to have a revolution 
then we've got to have some sort of a mobilizing catchphrase. And my mobilizing catchphrase is adapt to act and learn. Now, obviously there, there, there are little dots there, so that means adapt is a acronym, right? It's all caps. So here's the acronym. Here's the summary of this process. It starts with alignment, and, and when we align on, on goals and key performance indicators, that's a, it's effectively a one-time thing. It's not like we never come back and revisit our goals and KPIs, but we shouldn't be changing our goals all the time. So alignment, you know, setting goals and KPIs is a way to, to get alignment on what is it we're trying to do. These next th three kind of parts of the, the process, discovering, assessing, and prioritizing hypotheses, these need to be happening continuously in an ongoing cycle of always discovering hypotheses anytime somebody has one. Having a process that says if it's two in the morning and you have an idea, I can capture that hypothesis. Assessing them. How are we actually going to test or validate that hypothesis? What's the effort going to be? Prioritizing, because we can't test all of them if we're, if we're discovering all the time. So that's a continuous process. And then what that does is sets up that every time we have bandwidth, the next time, the next analysis we're going to do, we're always testing kind of the highest priority, the best hypothesis that we could be uh, testing. And I'll just say right now that the test, this is not an, an A-B test. That's, that's too narrow of a definition here. It's really more about using the right tool, the right approach to validate a hypothesis. Then we need to actually act on the results. And I think as analysts, a lot of times we, we think that once we're done uh, uh, testing a hypothesis, we're done. But there are ways that we as analysts can, can own a process that actually helps drive action and measures the impact of that action. And then even there's a broader part, how do we make the organization smarter, learning for the future? So let's just walk through that, starting with alignment. So, you know, telling a room full of, of analysts that, that we need to have clear goals and KPIs is, is not, that's gonna, that will put people to sleep. But I do think that we as analysts sometimes sort of start off with saying, what are your key performance indicators? And we don't get a good answer from the marketer that we're working from. We try, we ask a couple of different ways, we ask politely, we don't get a good answer. So we say, okay, I'm, I'm clearly not going to get KPIs, I need to just move on. And we need to not do that. The fact is, the marketers, the users we're supporting, they have goals. They may not be super clear goals, but you, you know, if they're running a, a, a pure play e-commerce website, yeah, their goals are probably clear. They wanna drive revenue, conversion rate, average order value. But what if they're in packaged goods? What if they're selling shampoo? Or what if they're selling frozen dinners and you can't buy them online? What if they're in B2B and it's, it's lead generation? The goals are still there. It's just they may not be very clear. And as an analyst, part of our process, part of our skill set we can develop is to help bring those goals into focus and make those clear. And the way not to do that is by asking, what are your key performance indicators? But something I learned from a guy I worked with uh, several years ago, and we did a lot of internal training at this agency to try to, to help our account managers get better at, at better equipped at understanding how to use data and how to, how, to get, how to set the analyst up for success, which ultimately was setting the agency and our client up for success. And he would always, in these trainings, say, look, you know, finding KPIs is, is simple, but it's not easy. He said it was just two questions. And then I kind of put my marketing hat on and I've since sort of branded those as the two magic questions. And instead of asking, what are your key performance indicators, ask a simpler question. The first question is, what is it we're trying to do? Why, why do we have this website? Why are we launching this campaign? What is this new landing page? What is it we're trying to actually achieve? And if we just stop there and probe and are active listeners and, and play things back and really help articulate as, as clearly and concisely as possible, what is it we're trying to do? You know, the elevator pitch that the marketer is going to use when they bump into the CEO in the elevator and the CEO says, what is it you're working on? They're going to say, I am, you know, trying to, um, 
improve our customers' loyalty by making sure they're, they're aware when they come to our site of all the services we have to offer. So if we really answer that question clearly, you know, clear, that's where we're asking the goals. But we're not asking it as, what are your goals? We're asking just, what are we trying to do? That then sets up the second question. Just how do we know if we've done that? So we're not asking for, what are your success metrics? Or what are your KPIs? We're just saying, how are you going to know if you've done that? So when it comes to getting to goals and KPIs, I've started using these two questions, uh, not you know heavily, formally, not in a survey, but that's the mindset that I walk in with every time I'm having a conversation with a client and we're trying to get to that, what are the right KPIs? I always start with saying, what are the higher level things? What is it we're really trying to do? And then ask the question in the way of how do we know if we've done that? So I'm not going to belabor uh, all of the, the kind of other tips and tricks for, for alignment around goals and KPIs. This is one place where clearhead.me slash emetrics, there's a download that has sort of a, a pseudo flowchart laid out uh, that goes into to more detail than is shown here around how to ask those magic questions, how to sort of probe and, and get answers that are most uh, uh, useful. But beyond that, how do we actually set targets? Because a lot of what we're doing with digital will say, I don't have an industry benchmark. I don't have historical data. I've never done something like this before. I can't set a target. And I will argue vigorously that you absolutely can always set a target. The targets are gonna be more likely to be wrong, but there's enormous value in setting a target upfront before you started executing and there are ways to do that, and some of that's also, it's just a one-page uh, PDF that you can download that has some of those tips. Ultimately, what we're trying to get to is a dashboard. And we wanna have a dashboard that is clear, succinct, clean, that is well-structured, structured around that first question. What is it we're trying to do? In the case of this dashboard, we are trying to drive online revenue, uh, uh, engagement, visitor engagement, and increase the reach of the site. Okay, great, we can do that. So the dashboard should be automated. Uh, do not wanna spend time every once a week or once a month spending hours pulling data and updating this. There are lots of tools out there to help with automation that will help really present a clear, clean dashboard. This one is actually in Excel and it auto refreshes. It pulls data from Google Analytics using a a tool called ShufflePoint. It pulls data from the client's backend database through a ODBC connection. It took some time to set up, but once it's there, it sits there and refreshes itself once an hour, runs on a big screen uh, in their office, and is actually showing the, the metrics that actually matter to them. So all of that is just stepping back a little bit. That's performance measurement. When we align on goals and KPIs, we're trying to set up how are we gonna measure our performance. We, we align up front and then we're just kind of off and doing that. That's the basis, not only to measure the performance, but to keep, make sure everyone is clear on what is it we're trying to do. So it sort of serves a dual purpose. It's actually showing how we're doing, but it also shows what it is we're trying to do, if done right. So the rest of this presentation is in the rest of the process is really where the, the added value comes in. And that's the hypothesis validation piece. So we move into the hypotheses. The first thing we want to do is talk about what's a hypothesis and why do we care about a hypothesis? Well, remember eighth grade science class, remember the scientific method where you had to have a hypothesis and then you tested that hypothesis. Well, you know, guess what? That's really any good analysis. Really all we're doing is following the scientific method. We're testing a hypothesis. All too often we forget that's what we're doing, but the more we have a succinct, clean, clear hypothesis, the faster, more efficient, and more impactful our analysis will be. I'm actually doing the, the, the presentation thing of pulling out a definition, which was not in earlier versions of, of when I presented this, uh, this material, but I've kind of added it over time because this definition really kind of nails it. If we put on <clears throat> our analyst hat, a hypothesis is a tentative assumption, it's just a belief, made in order to draw out and test 
its logical or empirical consequences. Perfect. Now there are a lot of three and four syllable words in that. So what we'll talk about is we don't actually want to use this language when it comes to reaching out to the organization and discovering hypotheses. But that is what it is. That's what a hypothesis is. It's the basis of any good analysis. So if we think about it, where do we actually get hypotheses that we're going to test? Well, certainly we're the analysts, so we get them from ourselves. And, and there will be times when people will say, hey, if you, you're the analyst, you're the data person, if you need hypotheses, go get yourself some hypotheses, come up with some, test away. And we should, right? We should be engaged in the business. We know what problems we're trying to solve. We, we know the data. So absolutely, we will generate some hypotheses. A lot of hypotheses are going to come from our stakeholders, the marketers, the creatives, the uh, executives who are asking questions. They may not be framing them. They may not be coming to us saying, I have a hypothesis. But that's what they have. When they're asking us to pull data, more often than not, deeply embedded somewhere, there are one or more hypotheses that they're trying to test, even if they're not thinking of it that way. But I'd argue, you know, there's also everyone else in the company. The, the classic is, hey, you want to know how your website's doing? Um, you know, get out of your, your cubicle, forget Google Analytics and Site Catalyst for a minute, and go and go down to your call center and find your CSRs and say, what's wrong with the website? And chances are, they say, you know, two or three times a week, somebody calls in and they are looking to uh, return a product and they can't figure out where because they get lost because there's this, this button up here, there's this link up here that sort of looks like that's what it is, but that's not what it is at all. I have a standard response, I know how to work them through, but that's what's wrong with our website. So anyone who works for the company, who wants the company to be successful and interacts with customers and or interacts with your site probably has hypotheses. They may not be great and wonderful, brilliant hypotheses, but they might be. So part of the process is to recognize everyone has hypotheses and the broader of a net we can cast, the better. But there's a little challenge there is how do you actually get a hypothesis clearly articulated? You can't send an email out to the whole company and say, please submit your hypotheses. Uh, that, will, that will win no friends. We'll probably find you sitting alone in the, in the cafeteria at lunch. Because, you know, that's speaking a different language. It's like this old Far Side cartoon where, one of my favorite ones actually, where the human is talking to the dog saying, you know, stay out of the garbage, Ginger, bad dog. And all Ginger the dog hears is blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. If we go and ask, what is your hypothesis? What most marketers are going to hear is, I'm dragging you back to eighth grade science class that you hated. And they're going to tune out. They're going to say, wait a minute, I didn't become a scientist. I became a marketer. So we can't do that. But here's the thing. We don't have to use any three syllable or four syllable words to get a good hypothesis generated. All we have to do is say, complete this sentence. I believe some idea. Now, we can't just stop there. That's all a hypothesis is, is this is a belief, is an idea, an untested idea or an assumption. I believe some idea, but we wanna make sure that it's actually sufficiently specific to be actionable. So there's a second part of this. Then complete the following sentence. If I'm right, then I will take some action. So what this does is if somebody says, I believe our website sucks. Well, how do they finish the second sentence? If I'm right, then I will un unsuck the website? Obviously, no. You know, if they say, I believe many people coming to the site are looking for coupons and they're not able to find them. If I'm right, then we will add content to our homepage that makes it clear where coupons are located. So it sort of enforces that, yes, we've thought through from testing this hypothesis, if this belief holds up, then we, we've already started to think through what action we would take. So we don't wind up doing analysis that falls under that horrible world of interesting but not actionable. So if all we're asking is to get those completed, if you think about it, that's a pretty simple web form. It's pretty simple to say, hey, if you have an idea, can you just frame it this way? Or better yet, 
I heard your idea. Is it fair if I framed it back to you this way? And we start capturing those. Capture those in something we call a hypothesis library. And that can be a Google spreadsheet. It can be an Excel document. You think about it, it's just two columns. The first column is the, end, is the first question, I believe something. The second column is the second, second statement. If I'm right, this is what I'll do. And what we want to do is have, and this is kind of the, the basis for this whole process, is a central repository of gathered hypotheses. Use any tool you want. A Google Spreadsheet, Excel, we actually use User Voice. You could do this in SharePoint easily. You could build a Lotus Notes database easily. You can even do this in JIRA. So that's sort of the first part. It's discovering hypotheses and what's your process so that everyone knows that when a hypothesis comes up, when they have an idea, this is the place to go and get it into the queue for possible testing and validation. Because we're going to build on that going forward. So the next thing we have to do is assess the, uh, the, the hypothesis itself. We, we first have to say, is this a clearly articulated hypothesis? So a lot of times it'll come in and you'll say, well, you effectively submitted a, I believe the website sucks. You know, or if you have a hypothesis, I believe our site is difficult for international users to use. Well, that's, you need a little more specific. You know, why, what do you believe is bad about that? Let's tease that out into a more specific hypothesis or more likely a set of two or three hypotheses all related to that, that core idea. There is more specificity. We just have to pull that out. So once we've got that, Ultimately, we're going to prioritize. To prioritize, we have to know what investment is required. We're going to have to know what effort is required to actually test the hypothesis. To do that, we have to determine the approach. And it's real easy to fall into the old Maslow's hammer trap of when all I have is a hammer, all the world looks like a nail. And as analysts, a lot of times we get a little bit, bit too enamored with you know, our web analytics platform. Say, I spend all my time in Insight Catalyst or Google Analytics. And so when somebody has asked me a question, that's where I want to go to answer it. And that's, that's not good. Because as analysts, we need to realize that we've got more than a hammer in our tool belt. And we need to stop and consciously be think through, with this hypothesis, how am I best set to test it? What is the full set of tools in my tool belt? Because when a hypothesis gets submitted, I believe some idea. If I'm right, then this is the action I'll take. As analysts, we need to pause and fill in one more question or answer, or fill in one more statement. To test this, this is what I would do. This would be the best way for me to test it. If it's a hypothesis related to why people are coming to the site, what their attitudes are, we shouldn't be looking immediately at behavioral data. So back to the example of I believe a lot of visitors are coming to our site looking for coupons. Well, if I'm going to have, see the world as just web analytics, I'm probably going to go and look at my, my site search terms and see how often do people search for coupon or coupons. But gee, that's an attitudinal question. I'm using behavioral data. What did they search for to, get, to, to test an attitudinal hypothesis? Much better for me to have Look, realize that I've got a survey on my site and that for a percentage of users, the ones who are getting served the survey and are answering it, I ask the question, why did you come to the site today? So we need to think that through. Yes, we have web analytics. We may also have a site survey, voice of the customer. Maybe we're running uh, Google Content Experiments or Optimizely or test and target. We have a testing platform. Absolutely, we test hypotheses with a testing platform. Maybe we can do usability testing. It's in-house or it's external. Or maybe we're, we can use usertesting.com to do sort of a, a very, very crude form of usability testing. I love usertesting.com to test a hypothesis. There's lots of things. I can email a segment of my customers. I can look at my social media analytics. I can do focus groups. I can do secondary research. Depending on the company, and this, is, this isn't comprehensive, have we really thought through what are all the tools at our disposal? Because the best way to test a hypothesis is to use the best tool we have at our disposal to test it. So another download at clear.me slash is is actually a, a, a 
spreadsheet that sort of lays that out. And you can kind of fill in and say, these are the tools I have, these are the business owners, these are the experts on the tool. And you start to realize you've got probably more tools at your disposal than you naturally go to. So once we've got that assessed, we said we've got a hypothesis, it's clearly articulated, we know kind of the best way to test it, we need to prioritize. And you know, you go to many, many webinars or read papers on testing and they'll say, you know, big question is what should we test? And the, the simplistic answer is, well, you take all your ideas and you assess their, the likely impact they'll have on the business and you assess how hard it will be to test and then you simply start by testing the ideas that are going to be high impact and are low effort to test. And then you actually go try to apply that in practice and realize that's a really, really short list because stuff that is obviously going to be high impact, that is easy to do, you've probably already done. So it's not a simple formula. However, a formula can actually really guide the discussion. So one thing I've started doing, and it's been really effective, is to say, let's not make it a simple two-dimensional formula, but also let's not make it things on a, on a 10 point scale. So what factors you use are really need to be answered by what really is, makes the best sense for my situation, for our organization, as to what drives prioritiz prioritization of where we invest our analytics time. So yes, there's the scale of the impact. Yes, there's the effort to, to test or validate the hypothesis. But should you also be asking, does this hypothesis align strongly with the, the core business goals? Or is it something that would be a good idea, but it's not really something that the business is trying to drive? You know, how likely is it that the change would occur? If we say we're going to test that, you know, uh, shortening this registration form is going to increase registrations, but we know that for legal reasons, we actually can't shorten the form, then what's the real, what's the real value? Um, even asking the question, you know, relying on our experience, how likely is it that this hypothesis is a good, is a good idea? We want to get a whole bunch of hypotheses. We want to, to find you know, nuggets, but we also want to apply the, the logical world of finite resources. We want to look at ones and say, hey, there is no way in hell that uh, changing our site to be gray on gray is going to dramatically increase conversion. So we put that, each of those, you know, a simple high, medium, low we kind of put some numbers behind it. And the, the same hypothesis library, you can, you can download at claire.me slash emetrics. There's a, an Excel spreadsheet as well as a, a Google spreadsheet. And they do the same thing. It has sort of behind the scenes, you can assign weights and values and kind of build a model, which is, is, is there to just to provide some, some logical business rationale behind what really would drive prioritization. It is not going to give you the, the quantitative, objective, force-ranked list of what projects you're going to tackle when. It's, but it, is, it should take and push the real stinkers down to the bottom of the list and bubble the really promising ideas up to the top of the list. So I guess one other sort of subtle thing is, is or there's a couple things. One, you don't want to agonize over, is this a high or is this a medium? You want to blow through filling in these fields pretty quickly because it shouldn't matter. You have enough factors there that you don't have to be perfect. It's an inherently crude and subjective process. So not only do these different areas matter different amounts, this is not a high equals 10 points, a medium equals five points, and a low equals one point. Um, it varies by the factors and by the criteria. So you need to kind of think that through what really matters. You can play around with that model. And ultimately, though, you're trying to just put some sort of science around and capture and quantify something that's highly subjective. Because what you'll want to do, what we do is sit down with a small team, two, three people on a very, on a highly frequent basis, every week, every other week, and say, these are all the hypotheses that are um, open, that are available for us to test. New ones have come in since we last met. The business has evolved a bit since we last met. We're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna work through that list and take in kind of all the other messy factors and we're gonna figure out what is it we're doing next. 
So it means you could have had a hypothesis that was number three on the list in your, your last meeting, but you didn't get to it, and by the time you come to the next meeting, it drops off the list. That's okay. We're just trying to have a machine, and once you get through two or three of these meetings, what, what I've seen is you get into a pattern. So it's not like you spend half a day trying to go through 200 ideas and prioritize them. You get to where in 45 minutes or an hour, you have a very standard structure, you go through it, you discuss a few things, and it sort of naturally bubbles up, says what makes the most sense for us to do right now? When the next time, the, re the next resource that is available to tackle the next hypothesis, what is it they're gonna work on? So once you've kind of got that process cranking, well then you're on to actually testing. And this is where it's not testing, just A-B testing, it's validating the hypotheses with whatever the approach you've determined is right for that hypothesis. That's really where the magic happens, right? That's what we do, that's what we've been trained to do. We're setting ourselves up for much more powerful magic because we've, we've got a you know, clearly articulated hypothesis. We've thought through kind of logically, how is it we're gonna test this? We're clear that what we're doing is a priority for the organization. So we can wave our magic wands with, with much, much higher impact. So that's really all I'm gonna say about that piece of it. But then we need to actually act on the results. And the fact is, is we've got to recognize that to, to drive action requires effective communication. We can't just put an ANOVA table in an email and expect people to jump up and run and interpret and, and, and do things with it. Because the data, you know, it does not speak for itself as much as we would like it to. As analysts, it speaks to us um, more so than it speaks to others. But even if somebody comes up to me and gives me, they've been deep into some data, and I'm an analyst as well, and they just give me a, a table, a spreadsheet, it's not like that really resonates with me. They've been in the data. They've really been working with it. It really only resonates to them because they've spent so much time with it. So, you know, the data doesn't speak for itself, so we actually have to make sure we're really effectively communicating. And I've given, I've given other presentations, uh, formal and informal and soapbox preaching and, and you know, uh, beating my shoe on the table around effective communication. And I'm not gonna go deep into that uh, in, in this session, but I will say that when I present the results of an analysis, regardless of the type of tool used to, analyze it, to analyze it, sort of the way I structure it, regardless of if it's in an email, if it's in a presentation, even if I'm just speaking to it verbally, you know, always leading with the business problem. That's where having that clearly framed hypothesis makes sense or is, is really helpful because that's, that's getting to what the business problem is we're trying to solve. We start with that business problem, immediately follow with, here's the answer and the action that we need to take. Here's a specific action we need to take. So there's nothing about data in the opening because what I'm trying to do is get the people that I, who need to take the action, I want them to understand that I'm speaking their language. I'm articulating a problem they care about. I'm giving them an answer to that specific problem. Now I can't stop, I can't stop there. I actually, I have to back it up with some level of data but here's the trap that analysts, God, we fall into so easily, is that we wanna show all our work. And we just can't show all our work. We can't say, here's the answer, and now let me give you in a compressed format everything I've done over the last two weeks to pull all the data, all the roadblocks I hit, all the regressions that I ran to, 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 our, to show you why this is the right answer. Because that will result in this you know, the business equivalent of this, which is somebody drifting down to the iPhone in their hands to start checking their mail or who knows, play Angry Birds. So we have to communicate really effectively. We have to be very selective of what data are we picking? How are we presenting it? We're not just doing a screen capture out of Site Catalyst. We're actually taking the data that most clearly shows and demonstrates why this is the answer we've given. And we've got to show that really, really crystal clear. So when we do that, are we done then? We say, hey, we communicated effectively, now it's up, to, it's up to them to go take action. Well, yeah, we may not be the people who are actually going and updating the site or are responsible for that, but 
we actually can have our process kind of skew towards more likely that an action will occur. If we say, I need to write down what action is going to happen and when, then that will kind of force us to make sure that we're clear on that. And if we're clear on what that action is, then the people who need to take the action are going to be clear on it because we're talking to them about what's going to happen. We can write that in our hypothesis library. Here was the hypothesis. Here was the result when we tested it. So that means this person is taking this action on this date. And now I, as an analyst, can put a reminder on my calendar or in some other system, in Basecamp or whatever tool I use, to say, I need to confirm if that action actually happened. And if it didn't, I can follow them and say, hey, what, what, what's going on? Like I thought, like remember, you know, I'm going to remind you that, that we invested dollars to answer this question. We answered it. We should take the action. So it's a little bit being, it's a little project management. It's a little bit being a pest, but it's for a very, very good reason. And then we're still not done just to make sure that action got taken. Yes, we tested. As a result, here's an action that we took. But then what was the quantified result? And you know what? I get it. There are many, many times when we, we do an analysis, we get an answer, an action is taken, and it's really not possible or feasible to really quantify, you know, what was the true business impact? No matter how much we want to say every analysis we do, we can tie that back to hard dollars. We can't. But we should be asking ourselves, will we? Should we be able to? If we take this action, we know what, we, what needle we were trying to move. We know what we were trying to do. What is that quantified result? And when will I know that I've reached, I've achieved that quantified result? So again, as an analyst, you know, I, I've watched this happen how many times we rolled out a site redesign and the next day I've got somebody in my office saying, how to do? Well, the day after you redesign a website is not the day to measure whether it was effective or not. You know, throwing up a, a, a new landing page, you need to collect some data. Time needs to pass. That like completely blows the mind of some people, whereas analysts, it seems obvious. You know, our work starts, uh, well, we've done a lot up front, but our, the work of actually doing analysis, we have to have data, which means when we make a change, we now need to wait for some period of time before we can measure the results. So as analysts, we can own that. We can say, when do I expect to have enough data that I can measure and quantify the result? And I'm gonna put another reminder on my calendar and I'm gonna go out and measure the result. And I'm gonna close the loop and I'm gonna log that in my hypothesis library and back to the person, the business users I'm supporting, hey, this was the hypothesis. Ultimately, you know, it may now be two months later, I can track that all the way through the life cycle to the, the business results that we achieved in the cases where we were able to, to measure those results. So that's kind of what we can do with our process to drive closer to action. But we're still not done. We've got this, we've got to learn for the future. And by learning, that means looking beyond just the near-term action. I think we've got this misperception that if I do an analysis and I and the person I'm supporting get a little bit smarter because we get an answer, and so we make a change. And I repeat that again and again and again with a bunch of different people, then a bunch of individuals at the organization are all getting smarter about their, their area of the business. So therefore, the organizational organization is getting smarter. There's organizational learning occurring. Well, knowledge management doesn't really work that way. That's really a bunch of kind of, that's like dropping the ball right before the finish line. We want that to happen, but it doesn't happen naturally. Our process as an analyst can support and make it so that we get as much value out of every hypothesis we test as possible. So we test a hypothesis, get a result, take an action. We should ask ourselves every single time, this was the action we took, was there any, well and actually we'll, and we'll, we'll do this again and again and again, sometimes we take action, sometimes we don't. Every time we complete one, we should ask, is there a deeper learning I got out of this? Is this something where I just found something out about our consumer or that I'm pretty sure seems to support something about our consumer? Maybe it drives another hypothesis or maybe it's something that we really have learned. It's a little bit deeper than just the near-term action that we're gonna take. And a lot of times, no, there's no deeper learning. I did the analysis, here's what I got from it, I took the action and I moved on. But I need to ask the question every time. 
And you know what, there will be times where I tested a hypothesis and didn't take an action. But maybe that was because there was an assumption that was false. And a lot of people have that assumption. And I tested that assumption. Well, let's make sure everybody understands that we tested it. And our deeper learning is that's kind of a bad assumption. So let's not make decisions with a bad assumption. And what you can see if you sort of let your eyes blur a little bit, what you're getting to is this nice table that you can then sit down and once a month or once every other month and you can pull a list and say these were all the hypotheses. These were the actions that we took. These were the quantified results we got. These were the deeper learnings. And you can package that up. And you have a story that you're telling back to the organization that this is being data-driven. This is a hypothesis-driven way of using data. And I can show you that it actually gets us all the way through to action, results, and learning. It also shows that there are lots of hypotheses that wind up going nowhere that they don't result in action, but that's okay. If a science, the scientist has, if every hypothesis they tested turned out to be true, well, we'd have a cure for cancer, we'd have a cure for you know, every disease. Lots of hypotheses are gonna turn out to be uh, disproven. Uh, so ultimately, when people say they wanna be data-driven, the way that I define that is being data-driven means reorienting the business towards a uh, mindset of validated learning, having ideas, and then validating those, and then getting smarter from that. So, there's the process in a nutshell. Adapt to act and learn. And as I said, at clearhead.me slash emetrics, I think I touched on these as, they, as we went along. The kind of one-page guide on, on getting to great KPIs and targets the couple of the hypothesis library template, which follows everything through from capturing the hypothesis all the way through prioritization and tracking results. So it's a, it's a structure, you can, you can use it straight in Excel or Google, but you can also use it as a basis to, to build something somewhere else. This self audit template for what are all the tools in your tool belt as an analyst that you should be thinking about when it comes to the ways to validate hypotheses. And then because I didn't go very deep on the effective communication of, of results, I've got sort of my favorite sort of blogs and books on that subject is also posted there. So with that, thank you very much for your time.